Most programs will make decisions and selectively perform calculations based on those decisions. A common way to make your program selectively execute commands is to use what is called an if block or an if structure. In general, an if structure checks some condition and if that condition is true, an associated action is performed. Here's one example of a calculation that depends upon a condition. The functions define differently over two different ranges of x. If x is less than or equal to zero, the value of the function is zero. And if x is greater than zero, the value of the function is e to the negative x, or a decaying exponential. Evaluating this function for some value of x requires you to make a decision. Is x less than or equal to zero, or not? This is a graphical description of the decision-making process. First, you need a value for the independent variable x. Next, the decision as to which equation to use has to be put in the form of a yes, no, or true, false question. In this case, the question is, is x less than or equal to zero? If the answer to this question is yes, we set f of x equal to zero. If the answer is no, we set f of x equal to e to the minus x. Next, let's look at a programming structure, an if block, that can be used to implement this kind of decision-making process. This is the most general form of an if structure. The structure always starts with the word if and ends with the word end or end if. The if statement is followed by an expression that evaluates to either true or false. Below this if statement are a set of commands that are executed if expression one is true. So if this expression is true, these statements get executed and the if block execution terminates. The program jumps out of the if structure and continues executing any code below the end statement. To check for an alternate condition, you can use an else if statement, which includes a different expression, which is either true or false. If this expression is true, a set of commands below this statement are executed and the if block terminates. You can have any number of else if statements. They all work the same way. If the logical expression associated with the else if statement is true, the program does something and then stops checking any other conditions. If the logical expression is false, the program continues to check the remaining conditions in the if block. Make sure that you write else if as all one word. If you type else and if as two words, Octave thinks you're starting another if block inside the first if block and it will want two end statements. If none of the conditions in this block are true, the if statement can do nothing. An else statement will force your if block to do something. The else statement doesn't have a condition. The commands following this statement get executed as long as none of the preceding conditions are true. There are a few things that I want to emphasize before doing some examples of if structures. You're not required to include else if or else statements if you don't need them. So you can have an if structure that just says, if this thing is true, then do this, but if it's not true, continue on with the remainder of the program. The program exits the if block once it's gotten a true response to some condition. So if the very first condition you list turns out to be true, none of the remaining conditions are even checked. So only one set of commands in an if structure are ever executed. Commands associated with an else statement are performed if none of the logical expressions in your if block are true. An else statement ensures that something gets done before the block terminates. Finally, if blocks don't necessarily have to result in a set of commands being executed. If there isn't an else statement, it's entirely possible that the if block will have no effect on the code. This isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes you don't actually want to do anything. Now I'll do a few examples of if blocks. First, I'll go back to the example this video started with. The function I want to evaluate is 0 if x is less than or equal to 0, and it's e to the minus x if x is greater than 0. This if structure will implement this function. The structure starts with the word if and ends with an end statement. The if statement first checks to see whether x is less than or equal to 0. If this is true, f gets set equal to 0 and the program jumps out of the block. If this is not true, then f is set equal to e to the minus x, and then the program terminates.
This implementation never considers that x will be anything other than a real number, so it doesn't check any other conditions. If x is real, it has to be either greater than or equal to zero, or not. There are a variety of alternate ways this same logic could be implemented. For example, I could invert the logic by first checking to see whether x is greater than zero, then setting f equal to e to the minus x if that's true, and set f equal to zero if it's not true. Another possible implementation is to always set f equal to zero, and then only change the value of the function if x is greater than zero. This function has four conditions. The value of the function is negative two if x is less than negative two. It's x if x is greater than or equal to negative two and less than two. It's three if x is greater than or equal to two but less than four. And finally, it's zero if x is greater than or equal to four. I can implement this function with an if construction as shown here. In this construction, I'm using the conditions exactly as they're presented in the mathematical representation of the formula. So if x is less than negative two, I set f equal to negative two, and I don't check anything else. If x is greater than or equal to negative two and less than two, I do this and skip out of the block. If x is greater than or equal to two and less than four, I set f equal to three and stop. Finally, if x is greater than or equal to four, I set f equal to zero. However, I can simplify the implementation here by taking advantage of the way if structures work. If I keep in mind that we exit the structure after the first time some condition is met, I can do this. My first condition is the same as before. I check to see if x is less than negative two. However, I can simplify the second criteria just to check whether x is less than two. I don't need to check whether x is greater than negative two since the code can't reach this statement unless x is greater than or equal to negative two. If it doesn't meet that criteria, this code would have been executed and the rest of the block would have been skipped. Likewise, I don't need to check whether x is greater than or equal to two in the next condition. I can't get to that point unless it's already true. And in this version of the code, I'll just use an else statement to invoke the final condition. As long as x is a real number, this is the only possible remaining option. In this problem, I have a cantilever beam with a point load, w, applied at some distance, a, from the fixed end of the beam. We want to find the vertical displacement, y, of the beam resulting from this load at some distance, x, from the fixed end of the beam. There are two different equations to calculate the displacement, depending on whether we're on the left or the right side of the load. These are the appropriate equations. These equations are only good for values of x between 0 and L, the length of the beam. I can implement these equations with this code. For the problem to make sense, the point x has to be between 0 and L. So if x is less than 0 or greater than L, I'll assign y to be not a number, or NAN. If x is between 0 and L, I need to check to see whether x is between 0 and A. However, if the program gets to this point, I know that x is already greater than 0. So all I really need to check is whether x is less than A then I implement the appropriate equation. If I get to this point, the only other option is that x must be between a and l. So I implemented this equation using an else statement. Next, I'll use octave to demonstrate implementation of this cantilever beam example. Notice that even in this simple example, several different decisions are being made. I need to check whether the provided value of x is within the length of the beam and whether the value of x is less than or greater than a. Now I'll create a script file to set up the basics of the problem. I'll name the file B-E-A-M-D-E-F-L. I'll set constants in the script file. In the script file, I'll also check if the value of x is valid. If it isn't valid, I'll assign the deflection to be not a number, or NAN. If the location is appropriate, I'll call the function to calculate the deflection. The function is going to accept the physical parameters and return the displacement.
I'll also add comments to explain what the code is for and define the constants. Now I'll create the function to calculate the displacement. First, I'm going to need a function declaration statement. I'll name my function point load. The function will accept the physical parameters as inputs and returns the displacement. I need to keep the order of the parameters consistent between the function calling statement in the script file and the function itself, but I don't need to use the same names. The function checks to see if the position is greater than or less than A and acts accordingly. Notice that I don't have to check whether x is greater than 0 or less than L, since the program can't get to this point if that condition isn't true. Now I can run the program by typing the script file name at the command prompt. The program runs and the displacement is shown. Now I'll change the location to a distance larger than the beam's length to check the logic for catching errors. We've developed almost all the tools we'll need in order to do some pretty sophisticated numerical analysis problems, but there are a couple of more structures I still need to introduce. These are called for and while loops, and they allow you to easily perform very repetitive processes. I'll talk about them next.